So uh, we're going to talk uh, about endometriosis today and I'll talk mostly about MRI since in Israel we don't do gynecological uh, ultrasound, uh, that's reserved to the gynecologists. So I'm sorry for the people who came from France, uh, this is what we're going to talk about. So endometriosis, you've heard it uh, I think a few times today, is the presence of uh, functional endometrial glands and stroma outside of the uterus. And this ectopic tissue is hormonally responsive, so it can cause bleeding. Bleeding can lead to inflammation, to fibrosis, and to adhesion formation. And all of these are things that we can see in the MRI. And it affects about 10% of women in reproductive age, causing uh, painful menstruation, pain during intercourse, pelvic pain, and infertility. And it may be asymptomatic. The commonest sites for implantation within the pelvis are the uh, genital organs, the ovaries, the broad and round ligaments, fallopian tubes, and the cervix. There are a few therapeutic options. It depends on the location and extent and, and the, uh, of the uh, endometriosis. Many women uh, get medical treatments, either hormonal uh, oral contraceptives or other hormonal uh, treatments. But then the deep pelvic endometriosis, which we'll, we will uh, concentrate on today, uh, the main therapeutic option is surgery, and for that, MRI is very good for preoperative staging. There are three main theories of how uh, endometriosis is, uh, uh, came about to be, and uh, they can ex each of them can explain some of the locations. The most popular is the metastatic theory, which means that there is transplantation of uh, endometrial tissue, from the uterus to ectopic locations, and this can be explained either by retrograde menstruation or by spread through the vascular and lymphatic uh, systems, and again, a iatrogenic spread, as after cesarean section you can see in the tract and in the abdominal wall, you can see endometriosis. Another theory is the metaplastic theory, and that's uh, metaplasia of uh, peritoneal tissue or Mullerian remnant tissue into functioning cells, uh, this can explain why you can see endometriosis in women who lack functional uh, endometrium, such as Turner disease, as well in rare cases you can see it in men. And then there's the induction theory, which is transformation of circulating stem cells. So as everything uh, is divided into three, there are also three forms of pelvic endometriosis. The first is superficial peritoneal lesions. These are non-invasive lesions that are well recognized at laparoscopy but very often not detectable either by MRI or transvaginal ultrasound. Ovarian endometriomas, which you've seen many today, MRI is as good or even better than transvaginal ultrasound. And then there's the deep pelvic or deep inf infiltrating endometriosis, which is invasion of these endometrial glands and stroma for at least five millimeters beneath the peritoneal surface. And I would say that MRI, at least radiologists believe that MRI is superior to transvaginal ultrasound. So diagnosis cannot be made uh, solely on clinical criteria, and we have invasive and non-invasive methods. Laparoscopy with histology is uh, the main uh, for, uh, um, sorry, for superficial lesions, and we will not go through uh, laparoscopy because we're not gynecologists, and we will con uh, concern ourselves with the non-invasive methods. So transvaginal ultrasounds, just a few words, is the first line of imaging, always. It allows extensive exploration of the pelvis. It's well accepted. It is operator dependent and that's a problem. It also allows you to do dynamic imaging and see adhesions, which is more difficult in the static uh, setting of MRI. And it is recommended as the first imaging for suspected endometriomas and endometriosis of the bladder. It is less uh, used or uh, the value of the, the, uh, the ultrasound is uh, less clear for the other areas of deep pelvic endometriosis and of course for the superficial lesions. There are other forms which we'll not go into, uh, either rectal endoscopic sonography or saline cost contrast sonography, but these are not done uh, widely. MRI is usually an additional examination in complex cases and specifically prior to surgery. It has high accuracy in evaluating endometriomas and deep pelvic endometriosis. And the great advantages are, is that we have a large field of view, we have multi-planner capabilities, superior contrast resolution, and we can see the whole pelvis, all anterior-posterior compartments at the same time, 
and see very well the adhesions and involvement of the ureter that is very difficult to see in other imaging modalities. So on December 2016, just two months ago, the European Society of Urogenital Radiology uh, came out with new guidelines for MR imaging of pelvic endometriosis. They recommended that MRI should be a second line technique after ultrasound and of course before surgery for optimal staging and that there are some requirements for these examinations and we will go through the guidelines. So they say that you can use either 1.5 or 3 Tesla systems in evaluating deep pelvic endometriosis. They suggest that the patient should be uh, supine using phased array coils and abdominal strapping to uh, uh, lower the motion. There is no recommendation concerning timing of MRI in relation to the menstrual cycle. This is as opposed to what was said before that you should do it in the first half. And preparation, preparation, there was no consensus, but most of them recommend fasting, bowel preparation, uh, imaging with a half-filled bladder and not a completely uh, evacuated bladder, and using antiperistaltic drugs such as glucagon. You can, if you want, to use vaginal or rectal opacification. There is significant variability concerning the MRI protocols used. Most people use three, di three uh, directions of 2D T2 weighted images, sagittal axial and coronal or coronal oblique, and T1 weighted images with and without fat suppression, which is recommended for the adnexal endometriosis. You can, if you want, use gadolinium, diffusion, T2 star, but all of these are not uh, necessary uh, per se for endometriosis, but mostly for the differential diagnosis. What they did all agree on is that the typical MR features of deep pelvic endometriosis are lesions that are low or intermediate signal intensity on T2 and T1 weighted images, which correspond to fibrosis. And they can have punctite foci of high signal intensity on T2 images, which will be dilated endometrial glands and a high signal intensity foci on T1 weighted images, which will correlate to hemorrhage. The use of fat-saturated T1-weighted images was necessary, as you've heard a lot of times today, uh, to differentiate between the hemorrhage and the fat inside the lesion in the ovary. And you can see here the endometrioma, and you can see the T2-weighted image and the T1 fat set, and you can see how bright it is on the T1 fat set, as opposed to this dermoid cyst, which was high on T2, but then lost the signal on T1 fat set images. These are the main sites of uh, endometriosis in the pelvis, and we will go over most of them in a few minutes. A few words on superficial endometriosis. Uh, these are uh, plaques, superficial plaques, that are scattered uh, across the peritoneum, the ovaries, the uterine ligaments. They cause minor symptoms since they cause less structural damage to the pelvis. They are mostly seen on laparoscopy, and you can see these look like superficial uh, powder burns or gunshots. Uh, lesions, they're very uh, small. And on MRI, mostly you can't see them. You can only see them if they're large or th if there's hemorrhage in them. So neither ultrasound nor MRI are sufficiently sensitive to screen patients for these endometriotic plaques. And this is an example I found in the literature. And you can see here the ovary. All of these on T2 are bright, but when you do the T2 fat set images, these two small punctate of hemorrhage are the little endometrial plaques. What about endometriomas, what we call chocolate cysts? These are the most common clinical setting of endometriosis, and ultrasound, again, remains the first diagnostic method uh, in evaluating these uh, lesions. And you can see here in the two cases where you saw before of the homogeneous echoes in the uh, cyst, and this is the shading that is seen on MRI, you can also sometimes see this shading on ultrasound. You use MRI for endometriomas only in unclear cases, and then you see solitary or multiple masses. Again, high T1, you can see here, high T1 images, both on uh, fat set images, T2 cases. These are the shading in the T2 weighted images, and you can see here again, it's not very high T2, you have this uh, uh, less than uh, bright signal inside the uh, endometriomas, and this one actually has also a fibrous capsule around it, 
and you can see that they don't enhance. So in a Nexel mass with high signal intensity on T1 weighted images and the signal lower than that of simple fluid on T2 weighted images has a specificity of over 90% for being an endometrioma. Of course, if they are bilateral or multifocal, then that favors endometriosis as well. And this is a, just a graph that shows you the differences uh, between uh, the different uh, cystic lesions in the ovary. Endometriomas can undergo malignant transformation, and this happens in about 2.5% of patients. You must remember that. And the cancer that is associated with these patients are, have a better prognosis. It is also one of several benign causes of elevation of CA-125 levels, so an elevated biomarker as in its own is not indicative of cancer. And here we have two patients. One is from the literature and one is from our practice. And you can see these uh, little uh, soft tissue masses that enhance and, uh, and mass. And you can see a very large mass here, again, on T2-weighted images. Uh, this is T1 fat set, and you can see the blood in the endometrioma. And this is a soft tissue mass, which enhances very well. And which is benign and which is malignant? Well, this was benign and this was malignant. So there is no way of knowing without histology uh, by MRI which uh, did uh, undergo malignant transformation and which didn't. So let's dive into deep pelvic endometriosis. This is uh, the infiltration of endometrial deposit deposits of over five millimeters into the, uh, into the organs around. And the symptoms here are more severe and they are related both to the localization and the depth of the invasion. And you need to correctly diagnose before a surgery to get all the lesions in the pelvis. And MRI is very good for that, with an accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity of over 90%. And if you look at different uh, papers that were published on this issue, you can see very nice uh, sensitivity and specificity, but you can see that the 3T uh, is even more promising and the results are much higher. So we can divide again, we divide everything into three. We can divide the pelvic anatomy into compartments. We have the anterior compartment, the middle compartment, and the posterior compartment. And we will just go now over each and every uh, organ and see how the endometriosis can look like. So bladder involvement, this is especially in the posterior wall with obliteration of the vesicle uh, uterine the pouch, and you can see here on T2 weighted images, the endometriosis. You can see it here on T1 weighted images with the small uh, high intensity uh, foci, which is hemorrhage. And this is the ultrasound that was done for the same patient. These, uh, these lesions can cause dysuria and if they uh, invade the whole of the muscle of the uh, bladder, it can cause cyclic hematuria. Again, you can, you can see here on the axial and coronal T2 and T1 images, another small lesion in the bladder. Here we see ureteral involvement, and you can see the narrowing and the fibrosis around the ureter, and on CT, you can see the marked hydronephrosis that this can cause, and this is a long-standing uh, ad ad adenomyotic plaque. The most uh, common location, the cul-de-sac, this is uh, mostly in the posterior compartment, of course. And this is a, a common uh, problem for laparoscopy because if you have a large lesion and adhesions here, it can cause uh, a false peritoneal floor and then it will be missed by the laparoscopist. So again, the uterus and the cervix, the torus uterus is a very common place. This is where the ut sacrouterine ligaments attach. And you can see this here. And you can see also on the other side, you can see the cervix and the posterior fornix of the vagina. Again, a very common place. Uh, usually when the gynecologists say uh, rectovaginal uh, uh, endometriosis, they mean retrocervical and not retro rectovaginal. And this is uh, the rectovaginal septum where you can see a small lesion. This, in this case, they had opacification of the vagina, which made it much easier and this is retrocervical, okay? And what I wanted to show you here, that if the uterus is retroflexed, it's much more difficult to find these retrocervical lesions, and especially if they are small, and this is a very small uh, endometriosis in the retrocervical area. Uterine ligaments, again, you can see sacro-uterine ligaments on both sides here. 
One is much uh, more involved than the other. And the round ligaments, again, always look for these. These are something that are really overlooked most of the time. And you can see in both cases, one on the right and one on the left, how they are uh, thickened. Fallopian tubes, again, if you have a dilated fallopian tube with a blood content in it, it can be the only sign for endometriosis and always think when seeing something like that, that this might be endometriosis. Again, you can see here on T1 and T2 weighted images and the corresponding ultrasound image. What about bowel involvement? Well, that affects between 4 to 37 percent of women, depending on the paper you read. And the anterior rectus sigmoid is, of course, the most affected area. And if you have circular involvement, it can lead to stenosis of the bowel. Transvaginal ultrasound is still first line of investigation, but MRI can give us not only the, uh, the presence of endometriosis, but also depth of infiltration, length of affected area, and distance from the anus. And to make it more difficult, you have uh, different uh, types uh, of invasion, You're starting from adhesions going on to lesser involvement such as serosal and then mucosal and submucosal involvement. And the reason I'm showing you this is because if you have muscular involvement or more, you need to involve a colorectal surgeon in the surgery and not just gynecologists. So here are some examples of bowel involvement. You can see here on sagittal images and here very nicely the narrowing on the axial image and another one here. And this is a case where you have circular involvement with narrowing of the lumen. And this is just from uh, the literature because we don't do double contrast uh, series anymore. And you can see both on barium enema and on T2-weighted image, the narrowing of the uh, rectus sigmoid in this area. Adhesions are a frequent complication. And on MRI, these are speculated low to intermediate signal intensity strandings on both T1 and T2. And these adhesions fixate the pelvic organs. This is something that's really nicely seen, I think, on ultrasound because you can maneuver and uh, move the uh, organs um, manually. But it causes posterior displacement of the uterus and ovaries, elevation of the posterior fornix, angulation of bowel loops and kissing ovaries. And you can see here the two ovaries with the endometriomas that are kissing here together with these adhesions and again on coronal images. Another complication, abscess formation within an endometrioma and you can see where the arrow is, there is gas within this abscess. What about extra pelvic endometriosis? Well, the most common location is the abdominal wall and that usually occurs after caesarean section. And the characteristic symptom is, of course, cyclic pain associated with dementes. And sonography is non-specific for that. Uh, on MRI, it will only be specific if you have uh, blood content in it. So here are two examples. Again, one in the middle and one on the side. Two uh, endometriomas in the abdominal wall. And this is a case I looked for a long time to find an, a case uh, of endometriosis on the diaphragm and I could only find one, one paper that showed this, uh, uh, a nice image in the literature and then on Monday I opened a case and it, this was it. So this is new from this week, <laughs> a young patient with uh, endometriosis of the diaphragm, especially for you. Other sites like vaginal involvement, sciatic in nerve involvement, anything around in the pelvis, Uh, can be affected. And just uh, to go over two cases to show you that these things don't come in isolation and always look, even if you found the money somewhere, it can have uh, other areas and you can see here bowel involvement, you can see bladder involvement, you can see sacrouterine involvement, you can see round ligament involvement, you can see abdominal wall involvement, all of this was in the same patient, so before surgery the surgeon has to know all this. Again, another case where you can see abdominal wall involvement. This was after cesarean section. You can see uh, the endometriosis going all the way to the uterus here. You can see the bladder involvement. You can see endometriomas. You can see two fallopian tubes involved. And you can see uh, over here also, oh, sorry, also bowel involvement. So usually cases are complex. MRI has limitations and the sensitivity can be reduced uh, due to bowel peristalsis and this can even
happen after adequate bowel preparation. As we said, the retroflex uterus is a problem. Uh, small foci in the rectovaginal septum is very, are very difficult to uh, see because the walls of the vagina and the rectum are also uh, fibrotically, uh, look like fibrotic uh, lesions uh, on Tito weighted images, so it's very difficult to see. Uh, 3T is very promising and may be superior in detecting uh, linear thin structures such as the ligaments and you can consider uh, opacifying and distenting the vagina and the rectum with ultrasound gel. I looked at the literature and there are four uh, new meta-analysis done in the last two years uh, about endometriosis and imaging and there is no consensus regarding the use of MRI. Uh, radiological papers of course uh, favor MRI and gynecological uh, publications like uh, ultrasound but they all agree that if you have an, uh, an equivocal ultrasound, then you should do an MRI as a second line technique, and especially if you want to um, work up a patient before surgery. So in conclusion, endometriosis is a common condition with important sequela. The detection can be very difficult and easily underdiagnosed even on MRI. And a good knowledge of the anatomy and the findings that you are expecting in pelvic endometriosis is important for diagnosis, evaluation, and surgical planning. And this is from my daughter. <laughs>